Hi, I'm Dr. Sarfraz Bey, and I bring greetings from Digestive Surgery Clinic based out of Bellevue in Kolkata. This is my lovely team here, and I'll be speaking on management of ventral hernia in obese. Right from medical school, we have been taught that obesity predisposes to hernia and it also makes its management difficult. Anecdotally, we have been taught that obesity leads to increase in intra-abdominal pressure. It comes with comorbidities such as diabetes and is associated with poor wound healing, all of which explains why there may be more ventral hernia in its development, progression and complication following repair. But is there evidence related to this? If we try to look for literature suggest with, with the idea that the ventral hernia occurs more frequently on obese, we find strangely enough that the literature is sparse. This is one of the few good literature uh, which is available suggesting that increasing BMI or obesity is associated with a higher prevalence of ventral hernias. When we close laparotomy wounds in thin patients, such as inflammatory bowel disease in this particular paper by Sugarman, versus a laparotomy wound after an open gastric bypass for morbid obesity, the difference in the incisional hernia rates is 4 versus 20%. And therefore, it's a no-brainer that an obese person has an incisional hernia rate higher than a non-obese person. Patients who are obese and harbor a ventral hernia are more likely to present to the emergency with a complication and they are more in the need of emergency surgery which carries a 13-fold mortality according to this database. This makes surgeons approach a obstructed or strangulated ventral hernia as a GI surgery and the hernia surgery is potentially added only if circumstances are conducive. When such hernias are repaired in obese people, is the outcome worse than in non-obese? Let's look at what happens to recurrence and then we'll look at the surgical side occurrence and infections. It would be intuitive to think that the recurrence should be higher in patients who undergo repair for hernia in obese individuals compared to non-obese. However, in literature, when we look at it, we find that there is no difference according to some authors and there is a significant difference and the recurrence goes up to as close as 20% in obese individuals according to some other authors. So why is this discrepancy? It looks like that these data could be heterogeneous. The patients that have been studied could have been heterogeneous. And when we look at these literature carefully, we find indeed the literature which published no difference in the recurrence rate have a mean BMI less than 40 and the ones who have published a recurrence rate higher have a mean BMI of their cohort above 40. It is also possible that the higher BMI have higher hernia defect sizes and therefore hernia with itself could be the contributor to a higher rate of recurrence. So do surgery. What about surgical site occurrence in an obese individual compared to non-obese following a hernia repair? Well, the hernia grading scales have shown that comorbidities put the, uh, the grading as grade 2, which means the surgical site occurrence incidence increases with comorbidities such as obesity. It is also known that surgical site infection, which is a component of surgical site occurrence, 
also increases after uh, hernia repair in an obese individual, and this could be pretty significant. It is not only about BMI in, in this respect. It is known that higher the visceral fat volume, probably seen in android obesity or patients with metabolic syndrome, have a higher surgical site infection, and this may be threefold. Minimally invasive surgery can reduce this surgical site infection and may be the most important reason for its usage in hernias uh, in obese individuals. What about the usage of abdominal wall reconstruction in obese patients? The literature that I have shown you previous to this slide have been the usage of IPOM and Recently, we have realized that there has been increased interest in the usage of component separation technique and other abdominal wall reconstruction technique in complex hernia especially. And uh, it, is, it is a logical and valid question to ask what happens if we apply abdominal wall reconstruction or component separation technique in obese individuals. In this large study of 551 cases, it was found that the recurrence rate between non-obese and obese individuals when abdominal wall reconstruction technique was applied was similar. However, the surgical site occurrence and infections were higher compared to the non-obese. So, is there any clinical pathway that we can use to manage ventral hernias in obese individuals. Before I uh, give, a, uh, give away our clinical pathway, it is a good um, drill to see what has been published by Dr. George Eid in 2013 obesity surgery. And this comes from a center which does both hernia and bariatric surgery. What they have done is that uh, Symptomatic hernias have been differentiated from asymptomatic hernias and symptomatic hernias have been defined as those who come to the emergency with features of either partial or complete obstruction. So they are not those patients who complain of a pain which can respond to antispasmodics and the patients who come to the OPD but specific patients who are either partially or completely obstructed and are necessitating admission. The hernia is also looked on by a CT scan in these cohort of people uh, because it's difficult to examine and come to a concrete diagnosis in such individuals according to this paper and based on these they have categorized hernia as favorable or unfavorable. The favorable hernias are the ones with width less than 8 centimeters, reducible and midline hernias. Whereas the unfavorable hernias are ones which you can see here, large hernias, loss of domain possibly, a subcostal or lateral hernia, and maybe an irreducible hernia. So these will make the hernia unfavorable. Similarly, obesity is looked upon beyond a BMI number in this paper, and they have differentiated favorable for, um, from unfavorable obesity. The favorable obesity are the ones which are gynecoid obesity, so more fat is in the gluteal and femoral regions. The subcutaneous fat is less than 4 centimeters and the BMI is less than 50. Basic idea is to convey that these characteristics makes a surgery technically simpler, whereas just the opposite where the subcutaneous fat is more than 4 centimeters, the obesity is mostly android and abdominal and there's a higher visceral fat and the BMI is more than 50, makes it a more technically difficult operation. So based on these uh, characteristics, the management has been for asymptomatic hernia, the flow chart has been like this. Hernia and obesity characteristics are taken and if the if the anatomy is favorable, then the hernia surgery is combined with bariatric surgery. Usually in this paper, a sleeve gastrectomy has been combined with an eye pump. If the anatomy is unfavorable, then the patients are counseled in the clinic to undergo 
bariatric surgery first and a hernia surgery is advocated later. For symptomatic hernias, the ones which come with obstruction, if it is favorable anatomy, they are approached with hernia first, which of course stands to reason because these are emergency cases. And uh, in, even in unfavorable situations, it is, if time permits, optimization is done so that the, hernia, the, the, the surgery becomes safer. But in both these situations, focus is on relieving the obstruction and strangulation and hernia surgery is added only if situations are conducive. So this is the final picture as published in the paper, which basically is the same thing as I have mentioned. And with this, they have found 3 out of 28 recurrence at a follow-up of at least 2 years for these patients, which is a, a good result. The problems that we face by, uh, in our practice and the reason why we cannot follow uh, the protocol or the clinical pathway advocated in the previous paper as mentioned is that many patients in our Indian subcontinent do not want to undergo bariatric surgery. There is a lot of controversy surrounding concomitant uh, surgery and I would like to uh, say why we do not uh, prefer combining bariatric and hernia surgery. One, there have been authors who have documented more than 5% incidence of mesh infection with concomitant surgeries. We also realize that we have been using synthetic meshes and biological meshes in our, in our part of the world is very expensive and therefore that would add um, to the reason why we don't want to do concomitant surgery. The number two reason is that the concomitant surgery increases the risk of small bowel obstruction as published by uh, uh, paper, this paper. And thirdly, the, the bariatric procedure that is usually taken up with a hernia procedure is a sleeve or a band, which may not be the most appropriate procedure for a particular patient. A diversionary procedure, for example, may be a good procedure for a metabolic syndrome patient, which may not be a good combination procedure with a IPOP. Lastly, some hernias are complex and do not merit IPOM or IPOM plus. They merit an abdominal wall reconstruction like a component separation technique. If factors are favorable, we can do it as an open or endoscopic technique. However, more often than not, they are not appropriate and combining these hernias with bariatric surgery would not be justice to either the obesity or the hernia. In our part of the world, metabolic syndrome occurs at a much lower BMI and these patients have a higher incidence of infection. Therefore, we put a lot of stress in identifying not only the BMI but whether the metabolic syndrome is present or not and that dictates whether we would like to go for hernia surgery up front or not. So what we do is this. Before we have this clinical pathway which we have devised for ourselves and this is exactly what we do. For symptomatic patients, there's not much of a difference from the previous paper. In favorable situations, we go in laparoscopically. If we can reduce the bowel, if it's not gangrenous, we do an eye pump. If this unfavorable uh, situations are there uh, with a symptomatic hernia or an obstructed hernia, we take our time to optimize these patients. And then we offer only GI surgery, which is sometimes resection and anastomosis. And the hernia surgery takes a back seat in this patient. And I will give you an example later on. For asymptomatic patients, those who are coming through the OPD uh, or a clinic, these patients are divided into four subsets. The favorable hernia with favorable obesity, the favorable hernia with unfavorable obesity, the unfavorable hernia with favorable obesity, and unfavorable hernia with unfavorable obesity. So I know I'm sounding a little more confusing. So I will take you through a visual tour about these four cohorts 
and then explain why we choose the procedures that we have written uh, below them. So asymptomatic hernias uh, are ones that we are discussing now. The favorable hernia with favorable obesity such as this visual picture. So this is a small paraumbilical hernia. It's a obese, a obese patient but the BMI is less than 40. There's no metabolic syndrome and this patient we are very happy to offer IPOM or IPOM plus. And we find absolutely no difference in the outcome of this patient compared to our non-obese individuals. For unfavorable obesity, for example, in this patient who has a metabolic syndrome, whose BMI is 48, this patient, although the patient has an umbilical hernia, we send them for a medically supervised weight loss. And when these patients come back, we are happy to offer them IPOM+. Plus. If they are willing to undergo bariatric surgery for not only hernia but other reasons, then these patients are taken up for bariatric surgery first. However, there are times when we get unfavorable hernias in the setting of favorable obesity. So this is a patient of BMI 34, but the patient's hernia is a recurrence after an IPOM, as you can see uh, uh, the previous incision is there. So it's a, it's a recurrence after an open onlay repair, I beg your pardon, and there's a recurrence. So this patient has a fairly large hernia and we are more happy to give them an ETAB because if needed, we can combine it with your TAR and have a larger overlap of mesh than an IPOM. So that is what was done in this patient. <coughs> uh, this is another patient with an unfavorable hernia. Now, the last hernia was unfavorable because it was a recurrence. And this hernia is unfavorable, obviously, because of the loss of domain. And in this patient, because the, there was obesity, However, it was largely a gynecoid obesity. There was no metabolic syndrome. There was not too much of subcutaneous fat. We were happy to offer this patient a component separation. In this patient, we offered a bilateral anterior component separation technique with good result. And we have found that these patients with favorable obesity do well even with a large procedure such as abdominal wall reconstruction. <laughs> this is another unfavorable hernia in a setting of favorable obesity uh, in the form of a subcostal hernia and uh, generally in these patients again if the obesity characteristics is favorable it's it's okay to endeavor an ETEP technique which gives us a good overlap uh, of mesh in the subcostal hernia <laughs> however there is this cohort of unfavorable hernia, which is again very visible to all of us here. It's a large hernia, there's a loss of domain. This patient has metabolic syndrome, the BMI is 48. So both hernia and obesity are unfavorable. This is the patient where we counsel the patient for bariatric surgery first. And this is the only cohort where we deny hernia surgery till the patient has accepted some form of weight loss. What about symptomatic hernias, the ones which come in the emergency with obstruction? If the anatomy is favorable, then we do a CT scan. And uh, you can see in the CT scan here, you can see in the CT scan here that the bowels are dilated on the left side. And on the right side, the bowels are collapsed. And you can see that the hernia is just appearing at the umbilical level, which is shot here. And there is a cutoff of this hernia at that level, suggesting that this is an obstructed hernia. And this is what we do. We can go in laparoscopically, carefully, from the right side with an optical entry trocar and then we can probably reduce it with traction and since in this patient there is no gangrene no ischemia we can also do an IPOM plus for this patient and these patients do rather well for a symptomatic hernia with an unfavorable anatomy what 
we tend to do is we think about it as a GI surgery. We think about it as optimization. And I will take you through a case example to explain what we mean by it. This is a patient, a super obese patient who has, who has cardiac issues, who has diabetes, and definitely has a loss of domain. And there have been three previous repairs, and all of which have failed, and the, she comes in obstruction. So the important thing is to do is to, to do a CT scan to understand the hernia and the obesity and optimization starts. We have to be sure that there's no strangulation, which there was not in this patient. And after optimizing for five to seven days, uh, in this patient we had to go in because she wouldn't respond otherwise. And we found dilated aperistaltic bowels. We tend to resect the dilated aperistaltic bowels even if they're not gangrenous something that we have adopted based on our experience and in doing so we generally are left with a wide defect which we do not um, which we uh, we do not like to oppose for the fear of a post-operative abdominal compartment syndrome we remind ourselves continuously and constantly that these patients are sick and any post-operative ileus and abdominal compartment syndrome could lead to disasters. So our policy is to apply a negative pressure wound therapy over a collagen in these patients and to do relooks. And if it is conducive, we can do primary cover and anatomical repair. And if it is not, we leave it as such till it has granulated in a healthy manner and we can put in a skin graft. We usually go back in at least six months to a year later in these patients for the hernia repair. So, the take-home message from this particular talk I would like to share with uh, my colleagues is that obesity has an adverse outcome on hernia repair. There's no doubt about that. And um, in terms of surgical side occurrences, definitely so. And this could be minimized by increased usage of endoscopy, minimal, minimally invasive technique, and if you have a robot, probably a robot. The recurrence rate seems to be um, uh, an area of debate. We think that we can bring down the recurrence rate lower by using abdominal wall uh, reconstruction techniques. And uh, more we apply endoscopic abdominal wall reconstruction technique, we will probably be able to bring down the recurrence as well as the SSO in these patients. The symptomatic hernias are potentially GI surgeries. The hernia surgery takes a back seat. If the situation is conducive, we can do a laparoscopic repair, an IPOM plus. And if it's not conducive, it's best to resect and uh, tackle it as a GI surgery, use negative pressure wound therapies, and have the post-operative abdominal compartment syndrome as a significant uh, enemy in the management of such situations. For asymptomatic hernias, however, it is a great idea to, uh, to manage them by distinguishing favorable hernia and unfavorable hernia characteristics, favorable obesity and unfavorable obesity characteristics, and then to apply this algorithm where what we do is, uh, if you look at the asymptomatic, just to reiterate what I've already said, in a favorable hernia with favorable obesity, use an eye palm technique. With favorable hernia, in an unfavorable obesity, uh, we can advise them weight loss and to come back so that we can um, do the IPOM again. Um, for unfavorable hernia but favorable obesity, we do not hesitate to apply abdominal wall reconstruction technique. And if this is the only cohort, the unfavorable hernia with unfavorable obesity, where we ask the patient to consider bariatric surgery or we deny them till they have lost uh, enough weight. Thank you very much for your listening and I would be very happy to take your comments uh, and suggestions for this particular talk.